So um, what we're going to be doing today, we are recording the lecture, is just really going through the lecture. Is that annoying or should I just? The only reason why I want to use the microphone is because if I'm talking and drawing on the board at the same time, uh, I want to make sure that people at home can actually hear what I'm saying, OK? Um, all right, so um, first of all, are there any questions about going forward, what assignments are due, how the final and the retake are going to happen? Anybody confused or need some clarification? Yes? Yes. Okay. So because um, we really weren't able to cover that in, in as much detail as I would have liked, you had one five-point quiz after you watched the lecture. It was like an 18-minute lecture. And I just wanted to let you know, if you already had 10 top half questions and you already maxed out the amount of um, top half points that you could get, then you don't even have to do quiz 10, just so you know that, right? Um, also, uh, I didn't want to require that for you to study for the final exam on that material. So there will be seven uh, questions pertaining to one specific case study. And you'll do that after the final. Um, if you need a little bit more time after the final too, let's just say you're taking the entire time for the final. Um, I can give you uh, a few more minutes, either after the retake or before the retake, okay? Um, so it will be up to you, but again, it's pure extra credit points. And like I said, I can stay after if you want to want to take a little bit more time. Um, yes? Is it an actual case study? It is an actual case study. So it's going to be, um, in the video, it actually uh, has like one very brief case study within the video. It's going to be very similar to that. You'll see the parameters. You're going to have to decide whether it's metabolic or respiratory acidosis or alkalosis. And then it'll, it'll um, talk about compensation. And so it's just really more of like what you saw in that video, OK? So it's going to be um, five extra credit points, in addition to also that length constant uh, extra credit point uh, assignment that you had way early on for exam one. Pretty good? Yes? If we're taking the final mm -hmm. first day and the retake the second day, I we come like an hour in? Hour yes. In? Okay. Yeah, good point. So if you're taking the final on either day, please come at 1.30. If you're taking the retake, you don't need to come until 2.30. So remember, tomorrow it's 1.30 to 3.30 in 64 BioSci. And on Tuesday, it's 1.30 to 3.30 in this room. OK? Yeah? OK, so you can't take it until 2.30. And the reason is, is number one, people are still going to be taking the final and I need to keep it quiet. And then number two, some people aren't going to be here until 2.30. So I'll have to keep the room quiet until 2.30 and then I'll say, okay, everyone, final exams need to be turned in and I will pass out the retakes. Actually, I'll turn on the proctorio and then um, you'll, you can start with the groups and you can talk out loud at that. Pretty good? All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, any questions? Do we have? Yes. Yes, yeah, of course. Yes. You can turn them in. OK, so here's what I was doing for some other students. Um, because I would like you to have that as a study aid, um, I may go ahead and just like put in your grade and hand it right back. To you. So if you don't have anywhere to go, just go ahead and turn it in to me after class. I'll give you the grade and then I'll pass it right back to you. Does that make sense to everyone? If you uploaded it on um, the Canvas website, then you're good to go. Okay. The other thing for students that just came in, uh, Proctorio exams are open. So you can actually click on your exam now and see your grade and the correct responses. Okay. For those that took a paper copy of any one of those exams, 
Uh, the exam that you are studying for for the retake, I did bring them all here, one, two, and three. So if you would like to pick up your exam that you're gonna be retaking, I can give that back to you after the review session, okay? And you can have that, you can have it. Any other questions? Yes, one more, sure. Yep. Yes. Okay, so great question. How many assignments are dropped? Okay. Yep, yep. So for the problem sets, you had 12 opportunities, and you can drop two for 100 points, right? Uh, for top hat questions as well, you had 12 opportunities, and you can drop two, which means, I mean, let's just be real, right? <laughs> Um, if you already have 100 points for the problem sets, you don't have to do the last two. If you already have 50 points for the top hat questions, you actually don't have to do quiz 10 if you don't want to. Okay, I'm just being real for here, right? <laughs> okay, so, um, but I would recommend that you actually fill out the, especially the hormone worksheet because that's only going to help you study. and. Uh, before we get started, I want to make this very clear, okay? The hormone worksheet, I accidentally put the Excel sheet with the answers already up, okay? Um, I didn't realize that until a student actually emailed me and said, hey, the answers are already online, <laughs> um, which is fine, but I want to be very clear. There, is a few, there are a few things that are still missing. Okay, so even on that Excel spreadsheet, I do need you to know some of the symptoms associated with the pathophysiological states. So for instance, diabetes mellitus, whether that's type one or type two, you would expect that that person that has diabetes would have hyperglycemia, which means they have high blood glucose levels, okay? Um, for a person that has Cushing's disease, they would also have hyperglycemia. Some of the symptoms that we talked about in class was a rounded face, uh, muscle wasting, um, fat catabolism, and high blood sugar levels. And we can go through that again. But do kind of put a new category or column and make sure that you know the symptoms of some of these pathophysiological states, okay? That's in your lecture slides. I'm not going to expect you to know any more than what's in the lecture slides, but just make sure you study that as well. Some students I know just use that answer key and they don't even bother looking at the lecture slides, okay? Which I can tell you that, that will be detrimental if you just look at that hormone worksheet. That's just a way to organize the material, okay? All right, any questions uh, about the hormone worksheet then? All right. So, captured that on line two, that is, um, that is on our recorded portion here. I want to make sure that's... So, do you want to just start from the top as we always have? We're just going to go through the material. I'm going to slow down on some of the things that I, I really want to emphasize that I know that are actually going to be on the exam, and I'll kind of point you to some of the, the questions that could be asked. All right. So with that, um, you do just basic anatomy of uh, the GI tract. That would include the upper GI tract. We talked a little bit about the mouth. We did go into some detail on the teeth even. I'll review that as well. Uh, we talked about the salivary glands, and that's going to be very important. So I do need you to know some of the details on the salivary glands. Um, then we talked about the esophagus. One thing that I want to emphasize right here is the upper esophagus is under skeletal muscle control. Yes? In the lecture, it said skeletal muscle control. Yep. Yes, yes. So the upper half of the esophagus is under skeletal muscle, and the lower part of the esophagus is under smooth muscle control. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, no, actually, when, um, I, I'm going to, I don't, I don't want to, I'm going to keep it simple, okay? So, uh, the upper esophagus, 
is under skeletal muscle control, and the bottom part, the lower esophagus, is under smooth muscle control. Um, the reason why that's important is because when dogs in particular, like I was saying before, dogs in particular who have myasthenia gravis, the way they diagnose it is because there's weakness of the skeletal muscle at the upper part of the esophagus, and they can image that, and that's how they diagnose myasthenia gravis in animals that can't really say, I have generalized muscle weakness, right? Okay, um, any questions about that? So just make, I'm making that distinction. It is an important kind of um, fact to help diagnose myasthenia gravis in animals. All right, uh, then we got into the stomach. There's a lot of hormonal regulation, which I'll be talking about, okay? Uh, different cell types that are important to know, chief cells, parietal cells, and enterochromatin-like cells. We'll go through that again. Um, and then, then when you get into the small intestines, I need you to know uh, the anatomy there, too. That's going to be a labeling exercise. I always kind of give you a heads up on that. Do know the pancreas, be able to identify the pancreas, pancreatic duct, gallbladder, sphincter of Odi, and that the sphincter of Odi is located in the duodenum of the small intestines. Then I briefly mentioned, this is something that I want to make sure that um, you need to know, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum is part of the small intestines. We talked about uh, the the process of absorption, secretion, and digestion. Um, we talked about mechanical digestion, and we talked about chemical digestion with different enzymes. Uh, motility is another uh, fact that I want you to kind of emphasize. I'm going to emphasize motility in the small intestines is segmentation, peristalsis, and migrating myoelectric complex, or MMCs. Uh, in the colon, there's two um, types of motility. We had uh, prostration and mass movements. And don't worry, we're going to cover this too, but I'm just giving you an overview. And then we talked about the colon, and it's different, the anatomy. Ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and then the rectum and anus, okay? All part of the alimentary canal. Uh, then we talked about the defecation reflex. Okay, so we'll get into that, but anatomy is important. That's where I wanted to start off with. This is giving you kind of a complete overview of all of those different organs that you need to know, okay? Uh, and, and it's kind of giving you the label of where everything is. All right, so there's different processes we talked about. The four different processes are digestion, secretion, absorption, and motility. Digestion, secretion, absorption, and mo motility. Now, just to kind of put everything together, absorption in the gut, uh, in the small intestines and colon, actually happened first. That's why it's called absorption. But when we talked about it in the kidney, we actually started with the kidney first, in this class. Uh, remember your reabsorbing material in the kidney. That's why we distinguish between those two terms. Absorption in the small intestines, reabsorption in the kidney. When you're pulling molecules and fluid out of the tube and bringing them back into the circulatory system. Absorption and reabsorption. All right, this breaks it down into all of the different organs and gives you um, a little bit of information about their function. You can't really see this on this board, but this is uh, another study aid of basically what I just talked about. Um, now, what distinguishes, I'm going to bring a lot of things home right now because I really didn't emphasize this in the class on the, on the last day. What distinguishes physiology from other disciplines like biology, cell biology, biochemistry, microbiology, is our major themes. What physiology is, it's pertaining to homeostasis, control systems, and forces and flows. So it's not just about anatomy and structure and function. 
It really is adhering to these major themes in physiology. This is what physiology is, okay? Homeostasis, control systems, and forces and flows. You're almost thinking about the human body like an engineer would, okay? So that's, again, kind of giving you some information about the discipline. So it's not just about function. This is more biology, I would say. Uh, or what's known as integrative biology or systems biology. This is, we're taking it to the next level and talking about how it fits in to homeostasis control systems and forces and flows. All right, so um, the take home message with this one is that there is enormous amount of secretion and absorption in the gut when we're talking about fluids, okay, uh, water. Uh, you basically are secreting an enormous amount of fluids through the salivary glands, the stomach, and then when you get to the small intestines, the majority of that fluid is absorbed in the small intestines, almost seven liters per day. And again, that's exactly why cholera is so devastating. Imagine instead of absorbing seven liters, you're now secreting seven liters. You can lose your entire bodily fluid in literally 24 hours uh, with um, cholera. Okay, um, so with that, also you're absorbing about 1.4 liters in the colon. Usually you only eliminate about 100 mils of water in feces, which is pretty incredible. All right, the idea with the GI tract is that, and we did learn it this way too, the GI tract is a number of different organs that come together in a uh, organ system, right? This is an organ system layer uh, that has a common function of digestion, secretion, absorption, okay, and motility. Uh, and each one of these um, within the GI tract, the alimentary canal, um, is basically specialized compartments that a lot of times are divided by muscular structures called sphincters. And that helps to contain each of the compartments and allows them to have their own enzymes, their own function. It can vary in pH, composition, cell types, whether it's secretor uh, secretive or absorptive cell types. And across the board, when you're looking at species, all, all different types of species, there's a lot of variability. So if I could attract a number of students uh, in a second course, that would be one that I would really like to teach is a comparative physiology course. Uh, it's, it's tough though, because students are already overscheduled, you know? So, uh, but that would be a fun course to teach. Um, all right, so continuing on. Uh, I started off, let me go back to this slide. I actually started off talking about the upper uh, GI tract, okay? So we talked a little bit about the um, mouth. We talked about the pharynx, uh, the soft palate. Um, essentially, when you swallow food, and I'll get to this in just a minute, the soft palate rises up, and then the epiglottis bends down to protect the airways when you swallow food. Um, and I'll get to that in just a minute, but again, know the anatomy of the upper respiratory tract. Then I actually went into the teeth, all right? Um, the reason why I kind of give you some information about the teeth is I have had a number of students actually go to dental school and um, just want to make sure that you have some information about it. It is uh, important in um, mastication. So we did talk about that term. Mastication is a very fancy name for chewing, right? Mastication. So let me just switch over to the document camera real quick. I want to make sure everybody has that term. Mastication. And this is just a fancy name for chewing. And I didn't use this word, but I'm going to just make sure that I, this won't be on your exam, but deglutition is a very sp fancy name for swallowing. Mastication and deglutition. 
All right, so let's go back to mastication here. All right, so you do have 12 molars, eight premolars going from the back of the mouth to the front, um, four canines, and eight incisors. So um, pretty simple. Uh, what I would say is the incisors and the canines are all about biting and tearing. Okay, so the incisors and canines are usually, their function is biting and tearing. Whereas the premolars and molars are grinding and chewing, right? You're mechanically breaking down that food with the, the teeth. And then going through this particular slide, enamel is the hardest substance in the human body. Um, it basically contains about 96% of it is minerals, okay? Minerals like crystalline calcium phosphate. The other 4% are just organic materials and water, okay? So the dentin right underneath that is also calcified tissue. It's also calcified tissue. And it's one of the major components of the teeth, as we talked about in class. Um, right underneath that is the pulp cavity. And the pulp cavity is the living tissue of the teeth. Okay, It actually has um, all of the nerves, the lymph system, and the blood supply. And within the pulp cavity are, are cells called odontoblasts which give rise to new cells within that, that area. Okay, so the nerves. Um, then you actually have what's called the two legs of the root. These are the root right underneath basically the crown here. That's the upper portion of the tooth. Right underneath that are the two legs, also known as the roots. And then within the root canal, of course, is the nerves, the blood supply, and the lymph. And then I think this is interesting, the periodontal membrane surrounds the legs and basically helps to create um, adhesion to the bone, keeping the, the, the tooth in its socket. That's what the periodontal membrane does. And it also helps to buffer any kind of um, chewing behavior. It enables the tooth to resist stresses of chewing. Pretty good. So again, this is more anatomy, but yes? So um, should we like know like, the anatomy? In this case, I would say the anatomy, and then um, the function is really the incisors and the canines are tearing and biting, and the molars are grinding and chewing. It's pretty, like I said, this is more of an introductory course, yeah. So. All right, um, going from the teeth, uh, this, there are a couple of questions on the salivary glands on the exam. So I do want you to know these three different types of salivary glands. The parotid is the largest, followed by the submandibular, and then the sublingual. I should say the parotid is the largest, um, but not necessarily the one that contributes to the most salivary fluids. And I'll get to that in just a second. The composition of salivary, salivary fluid is, it contains mucus, mucins is the protein, salivary amylase that's coming from the parotid gland, amylase, anything with ace at the end, remember, is an enzyme. Amylase is an enzyme that starts to already break down carbohydrates within the mouth. And then bicarbonate to neutralize acid within the food that you're eating. And again, lysozyme is an antimicrobial agent. are already starting to destroy certain types of bacteria. Okay, so although the parotid gland is the largest gland, it only provides about 25% of the total salivary volume. 
only about 25% at rest. Once you start eating a meal, though, it ramps up to about 50%, the parotid. OK, um, the next gland that I want, OK, so let me just make sure that that's clear now also. The parotid gland also secretes a very serous or watery type fluid. OK, very watery. Should I actually write this down? Or Pretty good. So just to recap, parotid gland is the largest gland. You can actually see that right here. It's the largest gland. It's kind of the opening is in your upper mandibular um, area. And like I said, I had you kind of run your tongue along the upper part here. And if you kind of find a bulb, that's the opening of the parotid gland. So at rest, only 25. It only um, secretes about 25% of the salivary fluid. But then when you eat a meal, it ramps up to about 50% very serous or watery type secretions. And the parotid gland is what is actually secreting amylase. All right, so the next one is the submandibular gland. That gland actually accounts for about 67 to 70% of the salivary fluid um, at rest. And then when you eat a meal, it actually decreases to about 45%. Okay, and that's more in the lower mandibular area. This is called the submandibular gland. And it is not as watery, not as serious. It's kind of a combination of water and mucins. It's kind of intermediate between the parotid and the sublingual gland. And then finally, with the sublingual gland, which is kind of under your tongue, I would just, I always think of a St. Bernard. <laughs> That's just something that just comes up. A St. Bernard dog, you know even that, that they have like so much mucus secretion, it just like almost can touch the floor. <laughs> My uh, dog, when he's watching me eat, he just, he's very nice, he's very sweet, but you can just see the mucus strings go all the way to the floor. <laughs> Labs are like that. They're so like food motivated. Anyway, the sublingual gland is only represents about 3 to 5% of salivary secretions. And yes, it is just all mucus, Hot, very rich in mucins. Yeah, question. Is that 3 to 5% at breast yeah, just about. You ramp up a little bit more when you're eating, but it really doesn't contribute as much as the parotid and the, and the submandibular. Yes. All right. So I want to, I briefly mentioned this in the endocrinology section too. Uh, just remember that this is an exocrine gland. Question. Um, it's a sublingual, the smallest. It is the smallest, yeah. And it doesn't contribute as much as the other two when it comes to total salivary fluid. So this is a multicellular exocrine gland. It's an acinar gland. So it has an acinous portion and a duct portion. And again, it's an exocrine gland because secretions are delivered into an open cavity. It's just really the barrier between the outside world and the inside of your body. So it delivers the secretions into your mouth, not into the circulatory system, which is an endocrine gland. And saliva, its purpose is to help lubricate food, secreting amylase to break down polysaccharides, carbohydrates. Polysaccharides are a type of carbohydrate. And it helps to dissolve the food so that they can bind to taste receptors. That's what gustatory receptors are. And then you already get lysozyme secretion, so it starts to cleanse the mouth with antimicrobial properties. So this is how the salivary gland is organized. Again, it's a typical acinar gland. It has an acinous portion and a duct portion here, OK? So just a heads up, I just want you to know that the acinar 
the acinous portion of the acinar gland, it is secreting fluid that is very plasma-like. Okay, so you can imagine there's a driving force for filtration, right? Fluid is moving from the circulatory system. That's what this represents, a capillary bed right here. It's moving from the circulatory system into the interior of the acinus. And it's very plasma-like. So filtration is occurring. Meaning it is ice osmotic. It's the same concentration of solutes in the fluid, in this primary secretion, as the plasma. I'm going through this in detail because this could be a good test question, <laughs> just so you know. All right, so then the primary secretions actually then travel in the duct, and just like in the kidney, fluid is modified within the duct region. Those primary secretions are modified within the duct portion. So you can see that there's a, an enormous amount of salt reabsorption. But in this case, fluid doesn't follow. And so the secretions many times are hypoosmotic. Hypoosmotic. Okay, the reason why I'm using hypoosmotic instead of hypotonic is because, remember, hypotonic refers to how cells react to those solutions, right? The salivary secretions are hypoosmotic compared to plasma. All right, you also have these myoepithelial cells that surround the uh, first part of the duct, and it can control the flow. So a lot of times if the flow isn't controlled and you get a fast, actually an increase in flow, I should say, through the duct portion, then you may not be able to reabsorb a whole lot of salt if it's going too fast. So these myoepithelial cells help to control the flow to maximize the salt reabsorption. And you can see these nerves here, these neurons, they're also playing a role. I mentioned this in class. Remember, salivary secretions are increased by activation of sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so this is one of the only structures that is actually stimulated by both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system nervous systems, which I think is also very interesting. All right, so taste receptors. Um, on the exam, there's not going to be any questions on taste receptors, unfortunately. Um, I did mention a great uh, journal article that is posted on your Canvas site. Not only do you have sweet taste receptors in the mouth, but you also have sweet taste receptors in the gut in the small intestines that, when they're triggered, actually insert more sodium glucose transporters, and it actually causes an elevation in blood glucose levels, even when you drink like a Diet Coke, right? All right, so you're able to absorb more glucose when those taste receptors are actually triggered. Okay, here's where we'll pick up again. Um, I want to make sure that we understand what the esophagus is all about. Uh, the swallowing reflex is also called deglutition. Don't worry that we didn't cover that in class. Um, that is a term, I, if I did anything like that on the exam, it would say swallowing reflex, parentheses, or deglutition, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I'm not going to trick you on that. So the swallowing reflex is coordinated by the medulla oblongata. All right, in the brain stem, and it usually stimulates the appropriate sequence of contraction, relaxation in, participa in the participating skeletal muscle sphincters and smooth muscle group. And I'll go through that in just a second. There is a voluntary phase and an involuntary phase with swallowing. The voluntary phase uh, pertains to the fact that you, when you put food in your mouth, you use your tongue to move the food into the back of your throat called the pharynx. Okay, so here's the pharynx right here in the back of the throat. Just to give you some overview of the upper GI tract, you have the hard palate here, soft palate, 
Here's your tongue. The back of your throat is called the pharynx. Then the epiglottis here in blue is actually going to bend down and protect the trachea when you swallow the food. Okay? So again, the involuntary phase, I'm sorry, the voluntary phase is your tongue pushing that food to the back of the throat. The involuntary phase is this. The soft palate then rises up to protect the nasal cavity, and the epiglottis bends down to protect the trachea. That's the involuntary space. The food then slides into the back uh, posterior tube called the, uh, the esophagus. And again, very important, the upper part of the esophagus is under skeletal muscle control. The lower part is under smooth muscle control. So this is a nice diagram that's kind of showing you what's happening here. Again, I just want to make sure that you realize the upper part is under skeletal muscle, lower part under smooth muscle. This is a nice set of graphs, actually, to let you know what's happening over time with different pressure changes in the different parts of the esophagus. So the x-axis here is in time, and the y-axis is pressure in millimeters of mercury. Okay, so what I want you to notice right up front is you see when you actually have a bolus of food, before the food actually goes through the upper esophageal sphincter, you can see over time there's going to be an increase in that pressure as the food enters into that area. And then once it passes, it's going to come back to its original position, its original pressure value of zero millimeters of mercury. Okay. Uh, what you'll notice with the upper esophageal sphincter, this is a uh, smooth muscle that is actually a circular smooth muscle that has a basal tone associated with it. Okay, so what you'll notice is at rest, the upper esophageal sphincter already has a pressure that you can record at 30 millimeters of mercury. And then when food enters into the area, it actually relaxes, okay? So it relaxes to about zero millimeters of mercury. Then the food passes through. You can see there's an elevation in pressure. And then it goes back to its original value of 30 millimeters of mercury. So recognizing that the upper esophageal sphincter has a basal tone associated with it, and that when the food goes into that area, it actually relaxes is an important part of this process, okay? Then you can see the food moves through the esophagus and every time it passes through a particular area, there's an increase in pressure. But notice that the lower esophageal sphincter actually relaxes way before that bolus of food enters into the area. This is called an anticipatory relaxation. And the lower esophageal sphincter basically relaxes almost immediately after the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes. So there's an anticipatory relaxation, and then the bolus of food enters into that area. All right, so let's take a closer look at the lower esophageal sphincter. It also has a basal tone, about 30 millimeters of mercury, and then it relaxes again shortly after the food slides by the upper esophageal sphincter. There are two disease states that I want you to know about for the exam. The first one is esophagitis. That's an inflammation of the epithelial cells that line the area right close to the lower esophageal sphincter. Itis is just another term to tell you that it's inflammation. There's inflammation in that area. This is called esophagitis because the LES, or the lower esophageal sphincter, fails to maintain tone right, of 30 millimeters of mercury. So when that happens, a lot of acid comes up from the stomach, irritating those epithelial cells and causing inflammation, esophagitis. The opposite of that, and it's the reason why I talk about it after esophagitis, achalasia a lot of times occurs after long-term esophagitis, right? Achalasia is when 
it fails to relax. And it's usually because there's a lot of scar tissue built up because of esophagitis. Okay, so achalasia is a term that's used when the LES, lower esophageal sphincter, fails to relax. And again, it's usually a lot of scar tissue build up, built up because of long-term esophagitis. Okay, any questions? Pretty good about those two disease states. I talked about my daughter in class getting a quarter step right in the middle of her esophagus. Um, that just helps you remember peristalsis. It was a way for me to describe peristalsis. Peristalsis is the main form of motility in the esophagus. It's a coordinated uh, effort between smooth, circular smooth muscle and longitudinal muscle. Usually what happens was, is uh, circular smooth muscle contracts behind the bolus of food and longitudinal muscle contracts, pushing the food down the line into the stomach. My daughter was experiencing secondary peristalsis, okay? Her esophagus was trying really hard to get that quarter into her stomach. And that's why it hurt, and then she could relax because it stopped. And then it would hurt again as that circular smooth muscle contracted behind the quarter. But, okay, so um, anybody have any questions about peristalsis? Yes? I'm talking about esophagitis. Yes, yes. So achalasia Um, there are some other disease states. The most common occurrence is because of long-term esophagitis, but there can be other causes. But in general, achalasia is a term used when the LES fails to relax. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What is GERD? Yeah, so GERD is a term that's used for that reflux. It's, it's actually caused by either uh, overproduction of acid in the stomach which is kind of crazy because the pH after you eat a meal is like as low as two. But, and then it's if that um, lower esophageal sphincter fails to maintain the tone so that acid bubbles up. That generalized heartburn is called GERD, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And it's usually a term that's used with patients that have this occurrence over a long period of time. It's a chronic issue. And again, they usually are treated with omeprazole. I don't know if you remember this. This is the drug that inhibits that uh, proton potassium pump in the parietal cells. Yep. Just to bring things full circle. Yes, question. So you mentioned earlier when you were talking about the disease that it can uh, where? Um, under the upper esophageal sphincter. Under the upper esophageal sphincter. Yeah. So paracelsis does kind of occur through that whole area. So there does have to be some smooth muscle, I'm sure. Uh, peristalsis is just that. Because there is circular and smooth muscle uh, down the entire line. But the upper part of the esophagus is mainly under skeletal muscle control. Okay, great question. Just to clarify, I was trying to keep it simple with your question, um, but as you can see with peristalsis, it happens throughout the entire esophagus. Okay, um, I would say it's kind of interesting. I've had some interesting questions related to this issue too, like can we control that? Is there some way we're controlling the upper esophagus with skeletal muscle? That's a good question. I contend maybe sword swallowers can do that. I don't know. Um, but there is smooth muscle over the entire uh, length of the esophagus, too, because peristalsis actually has to be able to occur throughout that whole tube. Yeah. But again, the reason why I say that the upper part is under skeletal muscle control is a big part of diagnosing myasthenia gravis in, in animals. And that kind of tells you, too, that skeletal muscle control is a big part of that area. Pretty good? All right. OK. That was an intro to GI physiology. Um, here's where it gets, I think, more into detail. How are we doing?
We have until 12.30, yes, okay. Uh, what I'm probably going to do is spend a lot of time on this lecture, because I know there's a lot of questions pertaining this, to this lecture. Uh, we'll go through the next lecture pretty quickly. Not that there's not any questions on the third lecture, but it's just not as many. And then um, I do want to get to endocrinology, only because I want to make sure that I cover parathyroid gland, uh, because we weren't able to co cover that in class, okay? All right, so we've already talked about this slide. Ask questions. All right, so the anatomy of the stomach, just to start off with that, we have the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter. Some people know this as the cardiac sphincter, by the way. If you take a uh, animal diversity lab, they actually use they actually use that term, cardiac sphincter. I prefer lower esophageal sphincter. I think that's more um, what scientists use in journal articles now. Um, the body is here. The upper part of the stomach is called the fundus. And then the body again here. And the lower part is called the antrum. And then some people actually call this the pyloric sphincter. I'm actually going to be a little bit more precise because it isn't a true sphincter, as we know it, with that circular smooth muscle. I call it a pyloric junction. Pyloric junction. Okay. All right. So uh, with that, I want to make sure that everyone understands what receptive relaxation is. Okay, so with receptive relaxation, once you get, um, this actually occurs somewhat in the cephalic phase when you're just smelling and um, uh, looking at food, but mainly it's mediated through mechanoreceptors. Whenever you see this little like M structure right here, I want you to think of mechanoreceptors. The mechanoreceptors detect that first bit of food that enters into the stomach. That's the first part of the gastric phase. Sends a signal to the central nervous system by the vagal afferents. And then back, it's kind of a reflex. The signal is then sent back to the stomach by the vagal efferents. And that causes the fundus to relax in anticipation of more food entering into the stomach, okay? It's called receptive relaxation. You don't need to know any of the details, so I'm not gonna, right? There's a lot of details here about potassium channels and VIP, blah, blah, blah. That won't be on your exam. Just know what receptive relaxation is, okay? All right, um, there's also these pacemakers. This is kind of giving you some information about uh, motility in the stomach. Once food enters into the stomach, the stomach actually really ramps up. These pacemaker cells actually do have, they're expressing HCN channels. If you remember all the way back to exam two, we talked about those funny channels that allow for a spontaneous depolarization and a rhythmic autorhythmicity. This is a type of peristalsis in the stomach. It's a rhythmic peristalsis that actually causes different muscles to contract, okay? You've got circular smooth muscle, longitudinal muscle, and oblique muscles that are churning the stomach as well. We all know that when we get hungry and we start thinking about food, it seems like our stomach is rumbling. Well, yeah, it actually is kind of moving about, okay? There are muscles that are causing that rumbling. All right, so also one more term that I want you to know um, peristalsis actually occurs, the direction of peristalsis is going towards the antrum and the pyloric junction. And then there's a term called retropulsion. So when this occurs, when some of the food actually during the gastric phase starts to enter into the area close to the pyloric junction, it contracts and forces the food back up into the stomach. It helps with mixing, right? Mixing and churning. Retropulsion. 
All right, then we actually talked about what happens with the stomach muscles and everything that, with vomiting. So vomiting is actually a reflex that is mediated through the vomiting center. You might not have known this, but you do have a vomiting center. And basically what that does is it actually causes a sequence of events that occurs to create a high and low pressure so that food is going to be propelled out of your stomach and out of your mouth. And the reason, the way that occurs is you first start to retch, right? You're breathing in against a closed glottis, epiglottis, which creates a really low pressure up in the upper esophagus. And then your muscles, your stomach muscles contract, increasing the pressure in the stomach. As soon as the LES, the lower esophageal sphincter, opens, it propels stum uh, the food contents out of the stomach and out of the mouth. Yes? So is it the stomach or the abdominals? Yeah, that's a good question. I can't tell you exactly which muscles that are actually going to be contracting. But the idea is that it's going to create a high pressure in the stomach. Okay, but doesn't the stomach itself doesn't contract? Yeah, yeah, that's true. It, it's more of, I would say, the abdominal muscles. Yeah, yeah. Did I say stomach muscles? Yeah, in class, I actually said that that's kind of why your abdominal muscles hurt the next day if you have like a violent fit of um, vomiting because it is more of not the smooth muscle cells that are surrounding the, the stomach, but more of the actual skeletal muscle cells that are contracting, yeah. Yeah, fun stuff. Now remember, I did make a distinction too between vomiting and regurgitation. I have noticed sometimes that people use the two terms synonymously, but just know that they are actually not the same thing. So when animals, you know, actually, um, I'm, um, uh, giraffes actually have a type of regurgitation as well. Um, and again, this isn't the same mechanism where you're creating these two different pe pressures. What regurgitation is in other animals, like birds, is reverse peristalsis. So imagine that, reverse peristalsis, where you're actually that coordinated effort between circular and, and longitudinal muscle pushing the food back up into the mouth region. That's not the same as vomiting, okay? So don't use those two terms synonymously. Don't use them like they were just one, describing one mechanism. Good, good? Okay, all right. So let's zoom in now on the walls of the stomach. It is going to be important that you know these different cell types. All right. In the stomach, basically what's happening is uh, these epithelial cells, they grow and um, replicate, right? And um, basically until they come into contact with each other, they form tight junctions, which allow them to become polarized. So with epithelial cells, remember after tight junction forms, after those tight junctions form, you basically are, the cells have the capability of sorting proteins to different sides, which allows them to actually transport molecules in a one-way direction. It's called vectoral movement of electrolytes, okay? So with that, it prevents other molecules from going in between cells, prevents leakage. Mucus neck cells are secreting mucus Parietal cells secrete acid, and chief cells are producing pepsinogen. All right, pepsinogen is the precursor to pepsin, and it's actually the acid that's converting pepsinogen to pepsin. Pepsin is an enzyme that starts to break down protein in stomach, in the stomach already. Enteroendocrine cells secrete hormones into the blood like G cells. In the stomach, G cells are cells that um, produce gastrin, which is a hormone. 
It is secreted into the circulatory system where it travels back to the stomach area and causes a response, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, it promotes acid secretion. Gastrin promotes acid secretion. So let's see how this is organized within the wall of the... Um, in this one, I would say don't memorize mucosa, submucosa, and smooth muscle. Okay, don't memorize that. Uh, really just focus in on the cell types and what they do. Okay. All right, so the chief cells synthesize the pepsinogen, parietal cells synthesize and secrete acid. Um, one thing that I would like to mention, just to kind of put things full, to talk about it in its entirety. Okay, complete the picture here. Um, you actually do see that there are these mucous neck cells that are secreting mucins, okay? So these cells are also secreting bicarbonate, all right? So you may ask yourself, how does the stomach lining uh, protect itself, right, against a pH in that compartment as low as a pH of 2? That is really acidic, almost close to battery acid when you think about it, okay? So what's happening is this mucus that's secreted is very bicarbonate rich. So when acid actually starts to maybe enter into that mucus layer, it encounters a very bicarbonate rich substance that neutralizes that acid and protects those epithelial cells against damage. If that fails, that's what's called a gastric ulcer, okay? So just know that's kind of how the lining is protecting itself, yeah. Yep, yep, they secrete the bicarbonate. There's other cells that, I'm sorry, the mucus neck cells secrete the mucins. And then cells around it are actually secreting bicarbonate as well. Sometimes that bicarbonate is trapped under the mucus layer. Sometimes it's mixed in within that mucus. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't identify that. Yeah, uh, I would suspect that there's many different cell types that are secreting bicarbonate. Yeah. But one of the, so I would say just know the mucus neck cells are secreting the mucus, and that mucus, the mucins, and the mucus fluid is very bicarbonate rich. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you guys are asking detailed questions. That's great. Here. Yes. Okay, so mucins are the proteins, mucus would be the mucus, the mucin-rich fluid. That's how I think about it. Okay, so mucins, there's like a mucin-4, there's mucin-2s, right? The mucin is actually the protein. And when you say mucus, you're not identifying the different types of mucins. So those mucus neck cells are secreting the protein? Yes, the mucus neck cells are secreting the mucins and that's causing a mucus fluid substance that's lining the stomach. I could say it this way, mucus is mucin-rich fluid. Okay. All right, so let's go to this one right here. Again, this is giving you a little bit more information. It's the acid that is actually converting pepsinogen coming from the chief cells to pepsin. Pepsin is an enzyme that breaks proteins into different peptides, smaller peptides, polypeptides. The additional information here, again, this is a good test question, is intrinsic factor. This is, would be a slide that could easily be missed as you're going through and studying. Intrinsic factor is essential for life, just so you know. We could easily brush over it, but it is actually a very important molecule that is secreted by the parietal cells. And what it does, it actually gives you the ability to absorb B12, the vitamin B12. 
and B12 is really important in red blood cell formation. It also helps with energy levels. A lot of times with B12 deficiencies, people feel very tired. That could be part of an anemic situation. But the disease associated with a lack or low intrinsic factor level is called pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia. I think we have a group that's actually doing um, their video project on pernicious anemia. Okay, any questions about that? Pretty good? All right, so now, like I said before, you've seen this reaction a thousand times. Saw it with red blood cells, right? You saw it in the kidney, in the collecting duct, the epithelial cells that line the collecting duct. Again, it's the same reaction. Carbon dioxide and water can be converted to carbonic acid by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. And once uh, carbonic acid is formed, it's converted almost immediately to protons and bicarbonate. Okay? So once that happens, just like in the kidney, one, for every carbon dioxide molecule, one proton is secreted, and one bicarbonate molecule is absorbed. All right? So protons or acid is delivered into the uh, stomach lumen after you eat a meal by the proton the proton potassium pump okay so this is a primary active transporter that uses ATP to move protons into the stomach and it also moves potassium into the cell that's why this uh, potassium channel is really important to make sure that this pump isn't, potassium isn't the rate limiting electrolyte. It keeps the pump going. And there's a chloride channel. So again, I'm not being facetious here. After you eat a meal, you are literally secreting hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid to help break down that food. It's pretty impressive. Okay, uh, then also bicarbonate is actually being delivered into the blood supply. At the same time, protons are being secreted. Now, this is what's known as the alkaline tide. Okay, with every carbon dioxide molecule, you're delivering an enormous amount of bicarbonate into the blood. This is why when you vomit, you get rid of all that acid in your stomach, but you've delivered an enormous amount of buffer bicarbonate into your blood at the same time. That causes metabolic alkalosis, right? Metabolic alkalosis. All right. Okay, so here's where the hormonal regulation in the stomach can get kind of sticky. This is just looking at a parietal cell. All right, so immediately when you look at this slide, parietal cells secrete acid. Okay. But there's a lot of regulation of these parietal cells. They respond to gastrin. They respond to histamine. They respond to acetylcholine coming from parasympathetic neurons. And like I've talked about in endocrinology, somatostatin seems to inhibit everything. So they are negatively controlled. The, uh, somatostatin actually decreases acid secretion. Okay, so um, let's go to this next slide. This is giving you the full story, give you an orientation here. This upper blob, this upper blob right here is a parietal cell. It is polarized. We're going to say that these protons are secreted into the lumen of the stomach at the very top of the slide. This crazy looking feature right here is actually a capillary bed. And then this blob right down here, ECL cells are enterochromaffin-like cells. Okay, And you can see here acetylcholine from a parasympathetic neuron 
These are the efferent neurons. They release acetylcholine, and these are, I asked this in class, GQ couple, they increase calcium within the cell. These actually initiate, I'll go back to this one, what it does is it inserts more of those potassium proton pumps, so you get an increase in acid secretion. Gastrin, the hormone coming from G cells in the stomach, is delivered into the blood supply and it also travels to the parietal cells and it increases acid secretion by again binding to a GQ coupled receptor and then again inserting more of those pumps so you can deliver more acid secretion. Now you can see that acetylcholine and gastrin also have effects on nearby enterochromaffin-like cells. And so when the system really ramps up, when the gastric phase is getting to its maximum state, right, maximum acid secretion, it then triggers the ECL cells to secrete histamine. Histamine. These are H2 histamine receptors here, and they are GS coupled. So this is the trifecta. Right? Now you have acetylcholine, histamine, and gastrin on board, and this causes a phenomenon known as potentiation. Potentiation. This is so important, I am actually going to write it down. Okay, another term. Potentiation. It's a term to, that describes, if I was to look at each of the individual components, acid secretion that is actually uh, induced by acetylcholine, plus acid secretion that's induced by gastrin. When I add histamine, the end result is greater which is, this is acid secretion, is greater than the sum of the individual parts. That's what potentiation means. So if I measure the amount of acid secretion with acetylcholine alone, it gives me a certain amount. With gastrin alone, it's going to give me a certain amount of acid secretion. And with histamine, it's going to give me a certain amount of acid secretion. But when all three are on board, the trifecta, the amount of acid secretion is greater than the individual parts, potentiation. All right. All right, so then we actually went into what is the difference between the cephalic phase and the gastric phase. Cephalic phase is when you just smell or see food. Not see food, but see food. See, seafood. Sorry. Okay, so um, then you can see it's all mediated through just the vagal efferents. Yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So you can see that with the cephalic phase, we're just mediated through just the vagal efferents. Okay, so what does that mean? Vagal is cranial nerve 10, which is parasympathetic neurons. Remember, parasympathetic is resting and digesting. So these are the vagal efferents that are already secreting acetylcholine. Parietal cells are secreting a little bit of acid. G cells are actually activated by gastrin-releasing peptide. And gastrin is feeding back on those parietal cells. So you're getting a certain amount of acid secretion and motility already with the cephalic phase. With the gastric phase, once you get food in the stomach, it's a long reflex. There's a signal that's sent through the vagal afferents all the way to the central nervous system and back via the vagal efferents. And you're, getting, you're ramping up the acetylcholine in that area, more acid secretion, more gastrin is released. This is where you actually get the ECL cells to start to secrete histamine. 
and that gives you the maximum acid secretion in the stomach. And you have these long reflexes that go to the central nervous system and some very short reflexes that are all contained within the stomach. Okay? Yeah? So, like, what's better than, or, like, what's a good It's kind of like a process, right? It's the sequence of events that happens when you eat. At first, you're just smelling and seeing the food, and you get a little bit of acid secretion. But if you really want to digest that food chemically, that maximum acid secretion is really important. You're getting the maximum motility. Okay, so you've really ramped up the system to maximize mechanical and chemical digestion. So do you want like long reflexes or short? I see. The short reflexes really, um, and the long reflexes, they really are only initiated in the gastric phase. And both of them are important. I see what you're saying. I'm just Oh, okay. So looking at this graph right here, you have these, again, mechanoreceptors that are just triggering different neurons. Some of them are going all the way back to the central nervous system and back, and then some of them are the mechanoreceptors you can see are just triggering local short neurons, and they both are playing a role. It's just they're both happening at the same time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then if you need some text associated with it, these next slides are really kind of telling you uh, about a little bit. It's really the same material. It's just organized a, a little bit differently. Um, all right, so here's where I'm going to. That's pretty much a complete story of, of the hormonal regulation and neuronal regulation within the stomach. Yes? Um, is there anything you want us to know from slide 12? Uh, let's see, slide 12. This one. Um, this is just a flow chart that's basically giving you the exact same information that I did in this one. And here's the, here's what, this part right here is the cephalic phase, and this part over here is actually the gastric phase. So this is a flow chart. If someone prefers reading the material, this will help you with text. But I'm more, I, you know, and that's a great question because I'm actually more of a visual person. And this is basically what I like to see. So this is the visual kind of um, diagram that I would rather see with it. But it's the same exact story. Same exact. Okay, and then if you need a table, right, and, and maybe elaborate on that process, which I just talked about then this table is also important. All right, this actually details, though, the intestinal phase, which is what we're getting into. Cephalic phase is just seeing food. Gastric phase is after you've ingested food. And then the intestinal phase is what I'm getting into right here. The intestinal phase is when a little bit of food enters into the small intestines, gets past the pyloric junction, and enters into the small intestines. Now everything starts to shut down, okay? Everything stops. What happens is you actually have sensors in the small intestines that are feeding back to decrease gastric emptying. I can't stress this enough. Decrease gastric emptying. So what does that mean? decreasing gastric emptying. What it does is it just allows for food to enter into the small intestines little by little. I call it piecemealing, right? It's not about dumping the entire wad into your stomach right into the small intestines. It's about slowing motility, decreasing acid secretion, and now just piecemealing it delivering it little by little into the small intestines. That's called gastric emptying, and what you're doing is in the intestinal phase is you're decreasing gastric emptying, okay? All right, so you have these different sensors, and we talked about these are part of your top hat questions. I do need to open up the top hat questions. I have a little to-do list here, too. So I will open up those top hat questions so you can review that before tomorrow.
Okay. Um, all right. So here's one box that says lipids. This is supposed to represent eye cells. These are cells within the small intestines that detect fat, detect fats, lipids, and it immediately secretes CCK into the circulatory system. Again, this is a hormone. These are endocrine cells that are releasing CCK, cholecystokinin, into the circulatory system, and this does a few things. CCK triggers the gallbladder to contract, releasing bile into the duct across the sphincter of OD into the small intestine. So it's releasing, causing the release of bile from the gallbladder, triggering the pancreas to secrete lipase, an enzyme that breaks down fat, and it's an elegant system when you think about it. Eye cells are detecting fat. It's sending bile to emulsify that fat, helping keep the smaller fat droplets from re-aggregating. And then the lipase gets in there and breaks down the fat. It's a nice control system. Nice uh, sequence of events. Okay, the next one is these S cells. So this box right here that says acid in, in it is supposed to represent S cells that detect acid coming from the stomach. It releases the hormone secretin, and then secretin enters in the circulatory system, travels to the pancreas, where it triggers the pancreas to release bicarbonate. So let me bring this full circle. After you ate a meal, the alkaline tide occurred. Remember, all of that bicarbonate was just delivered into the blood supply. And so when secretin triggers the pancreas to release bicarbonate, it's pretty much pretty rich in bicarbonate after that alkaline tide occurred in the stomach. So you can see if some of those mechanisms were disrupted, like maybe carbonic acid wasn't um, produced, you could see how maybe this would fail, right? This process would fail. Okay, so secretin uh, is a hormone that triggers the pancreas to release bicarbonate. People that have cystic fibrosis, that bicarbonate is actually moving across epithelial cells that line the duct of the exocrine gland in the pancreas and bicarbonate is going through CFTR. So people that have cystic fibrosis, this is going to be compromised. You're not gonna be able to deliver that bicarbonate as well after you eat a meal. And then you have some osmoreceptors that are detecting solute, increase in solute concentration. All three of these cell types and GIP secreting cells all feed back to the stomach to decrease gastric emptying. All of these sensors, in addition to the hormones they release, are also signaling the stomach to shut down. Oh, am I? Okay, gotta get to endocrinology. Yes, yes. So those, are, those three cells are in the small intestine? Yes, yes. All right, know this, the anatomy, as I talked about before, and the only one I'm going to actually um, talk about too is GIP. GIP is gastro, um, I'm sorry, glucose dependent insulinotropic uh, polypeptides. So these cells detect glucose and then they signal the pancreas to release insulin. Okay? Glucose dependent insulinotropic polypeptide is the hormone used to be called gastric inhibitory polypeptide, but. All right, so pretty good. Okay, so I'm gonna fly through this next one. Okay. I think the major things that are in names All right, 
I would say don't worry about the layers, again, don't lay, worry about the layers of the small intestines. Um, with the cell types within the small intestines, we have the enterocytes. These are the epithelial cells that are involved in absorption of material. The small intestines is organized with villi. These villus is folds or undulations that actually increase surface area. And then within each villus, you have these different microvilli. You can see it better here. Microvilli that are actually called brush border. Again, all of this is increasing surface area to maximize absorption. Uh, going back to our different cell types of the mucosa, goblet cells are the ones in the small intestines secreting mucins. They also have that protective layer of mucins and bicarbonate to, to make sure that you don't have any acid that um, causes damage to the epithelial cells. If that happens, this is called a duodenal ulcer. Enteroendocrine cells secrete hormones like I cells, S cells. And then panic cells uh, also are secreting lysozymes, they're secreting antimicrobial. Here's a picture of a duodenal ulcer. And uh, we also talked about the types of motility in the gut. This is in the small intestines. When I say gut, I'm meaning small and large. So I just better specify these are, this is the motility in the small intestines. Segmentation and peristalsis are two. Um, segmentation is a coordinated group of muscles, smooth muscles, that contract and relax right next to each other, okay? So over time, if you kind of think about this diagram in terms of time, the x-axis, oh, actually, it would be the y-axis in this case, would be time. And what's happening here, I think it's best if I do it kind of with hand signals, when one segment contracts, the segment right next to it is relaxed. And then over time, the next segment contracts, and the first segment relaxes. So it's a type of mixing is what's going on in the small intestines. This first line, contract, relax, contract, and then in between the two lines, relax, contract, relax, okay? So that helps to mix the food. Peristalsis is a coordinated um, event of circular and, and longitudinal muscle that is pushing the food down the line, okay? And um, there are, within some of these cell types, again, pacemaker cells. I mentioned this already before. Uh, these are cells that are expressing HCN channels, those funny channels, that give it, it, give it a, an eroding depolarization, that when it reaches threshold, it actually activates calcium channel that cause calcium spikes. These calcium channels that are causing these calcium spikes which leads to contraction. And it's a more, it's an autorhythmicity, spontaneous depolarization that allows for um, rhythmic contractions. And then finally, the last one is migrating myoelectric complex. After you eat a meal, I'd say about an hour or two later, you start these migrating myoelectric complexes that start in the stomach and over a 90 minute period of time sweeps through the small intestines trying to remove any remaining food into the colon. I think what's next here is these enzymes are important. Knowing what are some of the enzymes that are coming from the pancreas, the proteases we started with first, I do want you to know trypsinogen, that's the precursor to the protease trypsin. Basically, this trypsinogen is released into the um, intestines as an inactive form, so it doesn't 
degrade or disrupt the epithelial cells of the small intestines. And then it's converted to trypsin by these membrane-bound enterokinases. You're breaking down proteins. The other one is chymotrypsin and carboxypeptidase. That's over here. These are all enzymes, proteases, that break down large polypeptides to dipeptides. And here are some of the transport properties. You actually, most of them on the apical side are using either a proton gradient or a sodium gradient to move small peptides or amino acids into the cell. And then they're moving across the basal lateral membrane um, by these facilitated diffusion transporters where they're going down their concentration gradient. Yeah, question? So what are like the main for this one, proteases, I would say trypsin and chymotrypsin. And the reason why I kind of go through these transport properties is because these transporters are upregulated during certain conditions and they're good drug targets. So if you're a nutrition major, you know, and you're seeing certain drugs or, like I said before, taste receptors that are upregulating these transporters, it's actually good to know that these exist in these epithelial cells because you can manipulate the process if you know something about them. Okay, next one, amylase. Amylase is just an enzyme. A lot of you have maybe taken nutrition already, even, even through the, the Department of Nutrition and Food Science or Animal Science. Nutrition would go into a lot more detail on some of these enzymes too, but amylases are enzymes that break down carbohydrates. Remember, you already have salivary amylase coming from the parotid gland and pancreatic amylase. And basically, they are breaking down these carbohydrates into smaller monosaccharides. Uh, this is not biochemistry, so I'm not going to have you memorize any of this. But I do want you to be aware of this SGLT1 sodium glucose transporter that is using the sodium gradient to move glucose into the cell. And then you have these facilitated diffusion transporters that are moving these monosaccharides across the basal lateral membrane. And again, with high glucose levels, you're actually inserting more of these transporters to enhance glucose and fructose uh, absorption. And, they, and again, they can be increased, these transporters, by high glucose levels in the intestines. Or artificial sugars, too, okay? like I talked about before. Lipases are enzymes that break down fat. And bile helps to emulsify fat because of its properties. It's amphipathic. It has a polar and nonpolar side. And it, ag it basically surrounds these, these smaller droplets so they can't re-aggregate to these large fat globules. And then lipases get in there and break them down into fatty acids and monoglycerides that can easily move across the epithelial cell plasma membrane because they're hydrophobic molecules, right? The key to understanding fat absorption is knowing that they are converted to a molecule called chylomicrons, okay? Chylomicrons, like you see here, uh, it's really a combination of triglycerides and a glycerol backbone, which is then uh, a protein molecule is added to make these chylomicrons. And um, I can't stress this enough as well. Chylomicrons are then delivered into the lymphatic system, into the lymph system. That's what this lacteal system is here. And then it's transported to adipose tissue where it's stored. Bile is recycled. We talked briefly about diarrhea. Um, 
You won't have to know the different types of nut diarrhea. Yes, it is interesting. Um, but I do want you to know, uh, for your extra credit, that when you have diarrhea, you lose bicarbonate ions. It causes a metabolic acidosis. All right, we talked about the different types of large intestine motility. Uh, large intestines, this is the colon, is made up of hostra, these pouches. And when they contract, this is a process known as hostration. I think of it as packing like a mud pie, right? They contract individually, and what they're doing is they're packing the feces. So that when it gets into the ascending limb, you have mass movements. Mass movements is basically when one part of the colon contracts, and down the line, subsequent parts actually relax to help push that formed feces down the line. Okay, This is known as mass movement. And finally, the defecation reflex is initiated by stretch of the rectum. That's a good test question too, by the way. The defecation reflex is initiated by the stretch of the rectum. It is a true reflex. It triggers these neurons that just go to the spinal cord and then trigger the sigmoid colon to relax and contract, right? That's that urge to go. Um, then you have the external and internal anal sphincter. Just like in the urethra, the internal anal sphincter is under sympathetic nervous system control. And once the defecation reflex is initiated, those internal anal sphincters relax. So you can imagine if someone has a spinal cord injury, right? then that disrupts this relaxation of the internal anal sphincter and it would always basically be open. They wouldn't, right? Uh, and nothing, but nothing should happen until you voluntarily relax the external anal sphincter. And you learned this as a kid. I did mention this, this is gross too, but it's true. If you actually pinch or you voluntarily contract the external anal sphincter, it moves species back into the sigmoid colon, relaxing it. So you can put it off for a little while. <laughs> okay, there's no bathroom around. <laughs> All right, so that helps you kind of understand the defecation re. And finally, we have, I just wanted to mention, appetite. And I'll give you uh, what I'm looking for on the exam. Don't worry about this very complicated slide. All you need to know, ghrelin stimulates appetite. Peptide YY and leptin inhibit appetite. And it's all mediated through the hypothalamus. But don't memorize the neurons. Don't memorize that. OK? OK, so moving on to endocrinology, let's, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start from the bottom. I do want to make sure that I go through parathyroid hormone. And then we'll start at the top in case we, we run out of time. OK? All right. Okay, so here's where we left off in class on Wednesday. And I'm going to go through parathyroid hormone first. All right. So what parathyroid hormone does and calcitonin, these are, again, antagonistic hormones that have the opposite action. And what they're doing is they're actually regulating blood calcium levels. 
They are regulating blood calcium levels. All right, so the parathyroid are four different glands that are on each of the lobes. Remember the thyroid gland actually is like a butterfly looking organ that has four different lobes. And the parathyroid glands are on each of the four lobes. Okay, parathyroid. It basically triggers the release of parathyroid hormone in response to a drop in plasma calcium levels. So when plasma calcium levels or blood calcium levels are low, it's going to be sensed by those parathyroid glands and it's going to secrete parathyroid hormone. This is all in an attempt to raise calcium levels back into normal range, homeostasis, right? Okay, so what it does is it promotes calcium mobilization from bone. I'll come back to the slide. I think this is basically a very cool slide. This is a scanning electron micrograph that is basically um, showing you this osteoclast. All right, what is an osteoclast? See this fuzzy looking thing? It shouldn't be fuzzy. Let's see this very top image. This is an osteoclast that is moving along your bone like a snail, and it's degrading the bone. See this divot? It's like this is the path that it took. It is releasing. It's degrading the bone just a little bit and releasing calcium into your blood. Isn't that nuts? And it does this on a day-to-day -day basis. You have osteoclasts and osteoblasts. Osteoclasts break down bone. Osteoblasts bring, uh, increase the amount of bone. And you're doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. For my animal science students, think about um, like chickens, right? Having to regulate their calcium levels in their blood after laying eggs and stuff, right? Think about that. They are constantly using their bone as a reservoir for calcium, right? So uh, something that's very important is calcium nutrition and supplementation too, right, with some of these animals, including us, right? This is what leads to osteoporosis with people. And, you know, some of those drugs for osteoporosis, like Boniva, you know, you've seen those commercials. Uh, basically what they're doing is they're inhibiting osteoclasts so it doesn't break down your bone. Yes? Yeah, that's a really good question, right? Boniva is going to prevent those osteoclasts, but it still allows for some, but that's where supplementation of calcium is really, really important. Yep. Yep. All right. So going back to this slide, um, it promotes calcium mobilization from bone, increasing calcium um, blood levels. What it also does is it increases calcium uptake in the kidney, right, in the nephron, so that you get more calcium uptake in those tubules within the nephron. And it enhances calcium absorption from the small intestines. Okay, so how does it do that? It actually does this in concert. It does this with calcitriol. All right, so let me say, here's calcitriol. And I'm gonna bring it all home too. This is a lot of information, but calcitriol is actually a compound that's formed from vitamin D. All right, milk has vitamin D. You ingest vitamin D with a lot of foods as well. And you can also produce vitamin D from sunlight, right? It actually helps to um, synthesize vitamin D from cholesterol in the skin. That's why most Minnesotans are actually pretty deficient in vitamin D. That's why drinking milk is important too, right? Trying to get that vitamin D. So with all of that, uh, what it does is it produces a molecule called calcitriol. All right, calcitriol. And it is, calcitriol is a molecule that actually helps to absorb more calcium from the small intestines. Helps you absorb more calcium 
from the small intestines. So it has actions very similar to parathyroid hormone. All right. Any questions about parathyroid hormone? Pretty good. Calcitriol is another molecule, again, that helps to promote calcium absorption from the small intestines. Now, don't get calcitriol confused with calcitonin. All right, calcitonin is a totally different hormone that we actually talked about just recently this week that is secreted by these C cells in the thyroid. And basically what it is is it detects high calcium levels within the blood, secretes cal uh, calcitonin, and it suppresses osteoclast activity more than it increases osteoblast activity. So the main function is decreasing the activity of those osteoclasts. Okay, so what's interesting about, okay, so parathyroid hormone and calcitonin have antagonistic functions. And what's interesting is they are completely independent of each other. They don't, there's no crosstalk. Parathyroid hormone is detecting low calcium levels in the blood. It's secreting parathyroid hormone. And it's increasing osteoclast activity to raise blood calcium levels. Calcitonin, on the other hand, is detecting high blood calcium levels and suppressing osteoclast activity to lower blood calcium levels. That's a brain teaser, isn't it? Uh, all right, so um, this is a nice slide to sum it all up. Here is normal calcium levels in the center if calcium levels get too high going up the diagram, it releases calcitonin to bring levels back down to normal. If calcium levels in the blood are too low, it secretes parathyroid hormone. So you're going down. There's, it basically increases osteoclast activity to bring calcium levels back up to normal. Okay? Don't get calcitonin confused with calcitriol, okay? It's parathyroid hormone and calcitonin that have the antagonistic effects. Calcitriol actually has similar effects to parathyroid hormone by increasing absorption of calcium from the gut. All right, so I'm gonna stress this again. It's be nice just to take a little time after this review session and write that down in the hormone worksheet so that you can keep it all straight. There's just a couple of questions on parathyroid and calcitonin and calcitriol, basically. Just a couple questions, but good to keep that all straight. Okay, so before we go on, we have about 15 minutes, but I'll go through, this is more recent material. I'll go through each one of the hormones again and just briefly give you like a synopsis of what we talked about on Wednesday. But here's a couple of questions that may be helpful. This disease is a result of insufficient production of aldosterone. What do you all say? We don't have our top, I won't open it up, but what do you say? Is it Kahn's disease, Addison's disease, pituitary dwarfism, or Cushing's? What's that? Addison's, it is Addison's disease. So let's go through each one of these real quickly. Kahn's disease is when there's too much aldosterone. It's an overproduction of aldosterone or hypersecretion of aldosterone. Okay. Uh, that causes high blood pressure. Addison's disease is an insufficient production of aldosterone. 
Some of the symptoms we talked about in class were fatigue, lethargy, depression, vomiting, nausea and vomiting. So for humans, they feel super tired and they have some digestive issues. But it's hard to diagnose it in dogs and animals and cats, you know, those types of things. Um, what you notice particularly with dogs is vomiting. They vomit quite a bit. So Addison's disease is an insufficient production of aldosterone. Pituitary dwarfism, insufficient production of growth hormone, or some kind of mutation of IGF-1 receptors, right? Because remember, growth hormone is all mediated through those IGF-1. That's insulin-like growth factor 1. Cushing's disease as well. Yeah, that's right. Too much cortisol. This is part of your stress response. Or if you're taking a lot of steroids, uh, corticosterones, um, this could also cause Cushing's. It's an overproduction of cortisol or glucocorticoids that leads to what are some of the symptoms? Hyperglycemia, blood glucose levels increase, rounded face, fat deposit in between the shoulder blades, muscle wasting, fat catabolism. Some people that have um, true Cushing's disease may have a very signature body type with a larger trunk, like I talked about with um, the horse example as well, and then smaller legs that have a lot of muscle wasting in other areas of the body. Cushing's disease. Okay, so what two hormones are involved in the stress response? What do you all say? Everybody agree on D? Cortisol and epinephrine. Now, epinephrine is also coming from the adrenal gland, the uh, adrenal medulla, the inner part of the adrenal gland. And along with cortisol, it can cause nervousness, anxiety. It's that fight or flight response. That's why, uh, what, Xanax? I think that's the drug that actually blocks. Also, um, it's interesting, uh, beta blockers. Remember we talked about beta blockers with the heart? Uh, that actually inhibits the beta adrenergic receptors that mediate the fight or flight, the sympathetic response, lowering blood pressure by lowering heart rate and stroke volume. Um, sometimes beta blockers help with this issue as well, right? Anxiety and nervousness, they will give you beta blockers. All right, so cortisol and epinephrine, uh, tremors, nervousness, anxiety, that all is caused by the stress response. So, okay, so let's go back. Anybody confused? Now, this is material that we just literally covered on um, Wednesday. All right, so let me just review really quickly. This is something that I think the hormone worksheet will... What are some of the hormones coming from the posterior pituitary? those long neural secretory cells, vasopressin and oxytocin. Okay, you all know vasopressin, that's arginine vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone. What vasopressin does is it basically inserts those water channels, providing a pathway for the reabsorption of water, allows you to concentrate urine. What is the pathophysiological state associated with that? That would be diabetes insipidus. Why? Mutations of those receptors, it doesn't allow you to concentrate urine. You pee an enormous amount, and you're super dehydrated as a result. All of your solute levels are elevated because you have very low bodily fluid. So diabetes. Not only is glucose levels high, but all your solute levels are high plasma osmolarity, okay? Um, any questions? And, and that would be diabetes insipidus, insipidus. Any questions about vasopressin? 
Okay. Um, remember with vasopressin that it could be a problem with the hypothalamus. That would be neurogenic diabetes insipidus. Like when you get a head injury, all of a sudden you stop producing vasopressin. It doesn't, it's not secreted from the posterior pituitary. That's neurogenic diabetes insipidus. Or if you have mutations of the receptors in the collecting duct of the kidney and it's not recognizing vasopressin, that's nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Okay, oxytocin is part of a positive feedback mechanism important in labor and ejection of milk. It's a positive feedback mechanism because once a, a woman goes into labor, um, she produces some oxytocin, which causes uterine contractions and her cervix to dilate. And when that happens, it sends a signal back to the posterior, basically the hypothalamus and posterior pituitary, to release more oxytocin, which promotes more contractions and dilation of the cervix keeps going in this positive feedback mechanism to amplify the response until a major event like labor, uh, birth occurs. All right, that's the posterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary, the major ones that we talked about were growth hormone, prolactin is important in the production of milk, not ejection, but production of milk, thyrotropin releasing hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone. It's coming from the anterior pituitary. Uh, growth hormone and our um, sex hormones, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So we didn't really cover that in too much detail in class. Um, briefly, follicle stimulating hormone in Women actually help to promote development of the follicles. And luteinizing hormone promotes, there's a surge of luteinizing hormone during ovulation. For men, uh, follicular stimulating, follicle stimulating hormone does have actions in men as well. It promotes spermatogenesis in Sertoli cells, okay? So uh, that is the production of new sperm cells, okay? Um, and luteinizing hormone in men actually promotes testosterone production. All right, so those are the sex hormones, and um, I think we've covered, oh, uh, ACTH, okay? So I'm going to write this for so we can have a good list of answers to the growth hormone, the sex hormones, um, the stress response, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone. like a hormone worksheet. You need to know the target cell, their action, and the disease associated with it. And then I added that also, what are some of the symptoms of the disease states? So the Excel spreadsheet that I provided you is almost complete. I would just take some time to kind of look it over tonight, fill it in. The exam four is pretty much straight over the plate, okay? It's really, Here's the hormone, what does it do, 
Well, what disease does it, and what are the symptoms of those diseases? So if you made flashcards, you'd do pretty well. It's a lot of memorization this time. But there's no calculations. You don't need a calculator, right? Yeah. OK? Some students are better at memorizing. I'm horrible at memorizing anymore. I used to be good when I was a kid, but not anymore. All right. Uh, do you want me to go through? I know it's getting close to 1230. Anybody want to? Is there one particular hormone cascade that is really still kind of? I think the one that's one of the hardest is ACTH. OK, so I do want to mention, let's just go through that one really quickly here. Here it is right here. So uh, with ACTH, uh, this is all part of the stress response. So when you feel anxiety and stress, you're not only pouring out epinephrine, that fight or flight, you're also producing ACTH. So what happens is usually the hypothalamus starts out by actually secreting corticotropin releasing hormone. Now you don't have to memorize that. It'll say corticotropin releasing hormone and in parentheses CRH. Okay. Um, that enters into the portal vessels, travels to the anterior pituitary, remember? Anterior pituitary that promotes the secretion of adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. Then that actually travels to the adrenal gland to promote the secretion of glucocorticoids from the adrenal cortex region, like cortisol, OK? Cortisol is a type of glucocorticoid. So what does that do? Pours out into your blood uh, cortisol. And basically what that does is it promotes protein and fat catabolism, breaks down proteins and fats. And it does the opposite of what insulin does. It elevates blood glucose levels. So you get gluconeogenesis in the liver that produces new glucose, prevents absorption, it prevents the uptake of glucose, so glucose levels in the blood stay high. And one of the other ones that's really important is it suppresses the immune system. That's why cortisone shots work in your knee, right? It's preventing the immune response and inflammation. That's why you get sick readily when you're stressed out during finals week, unfortunately. So taking some extra vitamin C or Zycam is probably pretty good. Knowing that cortisol, elevated cortisol levels, suppress the immune system. OK, one other thing. I know this is a test question. What is the locus ceruleus? The locus ceruleus is that little part of the um, brain stem there that basically increases your attention and commits things for, to memory more easily. Have you ever noticed when you have a very stressful event that you remember it for the rest of your life, right? Like, you know, I remember being a kid and almost being in a bus accident, and I can remember that clear as day. I think I was seven years old. Right? So that's what the locus ceruleus is. It actually increases your attention and commits things for, to memory. Locus ceruleus, part of the stress response. All right, any questions? I'd go back, look over thyroid. We talked uh, a lot about this on Wednesday. Thyroid stimulating hormone, growth hormone, prolactin is the production of milk. So uh, can't keep you any longer, but um, I hope this really helps. I hope this helps. Um, if anybody wants to stick around because they want to pick up their old exam, if they took the paper copy, uh, I can give that to you now. If you took it by Proctorio, all of the exams are open. You can actually go back and see your questions and your answers.
Uh, I have a to-do list here too, so if you've looked over your grades and there's something awry um, and you want me to double check it, I will definitely put that on my to-do list for today, okay? All right, good luck everyone. I will see some of you tomorrow. Bye, yes. Um, hold on just a minute. Yes. Oh, uh, I just have a question on yes. this. Yes. Okay, I don't yes. understand exactly how you use it. Okay. So, like, yep. I know it's either you determine if it's actually built or this. Yes. But then how do you go yeah. about putting these? So, it's interesting. In the video, I kind of tried to figure out to help you about this, but it is complicated. So, yeah. Okay, so basically what's happening here is you do, you're looking at the pH, which will be given to you. Yeah. And you're trying to decide is this acid acid or alcohol. So that's pretty straightforward. Yeah, of course. Okay. So then when you decide it's an acid or um, event, then you decide, okay, so you would normally think that with an increase in CO2 within the body, uh, you would have a, an acidosis, right? But in this case, a lot of times with acidosis, you're looking at it and CO2 levels are super low. Okay. So that's not consistent with the low pH, right? So in this case, you would automatically think, okay, this has to be not a respiratory acidosis. This has to be a metabolic alkalosis. The CO2 is super low. If it's respiratory, it's going to be high. Super high. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so then you're kind of deciding, is it consistent with the pH value? If CO2 is not consistent with then you know it's a metabolic acidosis. Okay. And then what's happening is you have a metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation because the respiratory system is trying to compensate for the acidosis and it's hyper, you're hyperventilating. So if you were metabolic acidosis, it's always going to be respiratory compensation? It's always going to be respiratory Okay, gotcha. That makes sense. Okay, perfect. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you want oh, to just turning um, stuff in. So. Oh, Mike, also, just so you know, um, that chart is going to be on the board. Don't memorize it. That's going to be on the back of the board. Okay, yes. Um, just yeah. turning these in. Yes. And you can okay, so that's yes. Maya, and then these two. Okay. That's her case. Study, okay. Obviously. And then so these I'm going to have you keep these just yeah, to no, study. I yeah, that. okay, yep. so. Um, I'm going to just add this to my list, and I will give you those points. So you have both your hormone yep. and case study. Okay, so this is number 11 and 12 for you and uh, Maya. Yes. Um, I, I can never remember how to spell her name. M-A-I-J-N-T. Okay, and I will get those in this afternoon. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Hi. You wanted to spend a minute? No, I just oh, okay. What is it about? Is it on campus right now? Yeah. Take a look at your situation. Um, I would say though, don't not. Uh, I was going to do it. I just don't think I can do it. Yep. Yeah. You're okay. Good. Um, can I pick up an example? Yes, of course. I wanted, could you explain autorhythmicity? Yes. yes. Okay. So autorhythmicity is in the heart and in the GI tract, I should say, is myogenic. Uh, is myogenic. So it means that the, the response is actually inherent in the muscle itself. And what these muscles are doing is they're expressing those myogenics that cause an eroding depolarization slowly because it allows, it increases the permeability of both sodium and potassium, but that still depolarizes the cell slowly until it reaches threshold and that by the natural potential causing contraction. So because of the expression of those funny channels, it's a rhythmic contraction, reaching threshold, firing an action potential contraction, reaching threshold, Firing and action potential contraction. So you can imagine that's the reason why you have this heartbeat and you have these rhythmic contractions in the stomach. So that's what auto rhythmicity is all about. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Thank you. 